Yeah. And uh, so each of these paths or each of these minor diagrams can be like some kind of a Yeah, um, provided one keeps in mind something. You know the the um, in the Feynman diagram, one Feynman diagram represents really, in a certain sense, two processes. The process where one vertex is earlier than the other, and then the process where the other vertex is earlier than the first one. And um, in other words, if you turn the four-dimensional integral back into two three-dimensional integrals with step functions of time, uh, then you have those two, you, then you have two different processes essentially. In the path integral, things are always going forward in time. So the path integral has the two processes uh, represented. In other words, you're thinking, of course, of the space-time Feynman diagram, and uh, of course the path integral is, at least uh, as normally written, is uh, in, in this space-time, at least when we write it in the moment of space -time. Anyway. So let's see, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue. Should we move to, what should we do next? Should we go into renormalization or should we rather do half integrals first and then renormalization? Some of you have seen me do half integrals, so. I'm a little worried about order setting in, but on the other hand, um, I'd also have to do fermions, not just bosons. I think it would be good to to do the pentacles and then come back to renormalization. What do you think? Otherwise, it's just going to be prime and diagram, prime and diagram, prime and diagram, prime and diagram, prime and diagram. It's just a little numbing. That sounds true. Yeah. 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 Also, if, if any of you are looking at Z's book, which is an excellent book, well, it's all in terms of path integrals. There are no operators at all. so. Yeah, all right, so I think I'll start handing it soon. But we'll still have to do something um, last time and I think maybe it's good to, to, to redo that, namely the, the way we go from uh, S matrix elements to cross sections. So I'll just go through that a second time and uh, finish up um, uh, what we were doing, which was E plus E minus goes to U plus U minus. Well, 
Let me see. We, yeah, that's right. We, we have specified. We have specialized in that case. Okay. Well, the the S matrix element gives us something of the form two pi to the fourth delta fourth of uh, let's see p plus p prime minus all the final statements momenta some perhaps written like that times i m the Feynman diagram itself gives us gives us a formula for this, or a rule for getting that. And remember that our states are square root of 2 EP, a dagger of P, and possibly S, if, it's, uh, if the variable has spin. And so the norm of the state here is um, uh, 2 E. This gives you 2 pi cubed times the delta function. And if the p's are different, well, you get 0. If the p's are the same, what you get is 2e, 2 pi q, delta of 0. And that's 2e, 2 pi q, the volume divided by 2 pi q. Okay, so in other words, the, the reason for that is, of course, delta of um, p is e to the i p x d cubed x over 2 pi cubed. Right? And so if p is 0, you just have integral d cubed x over 2 pi cubed. That's the volume of the universe divided by 2 pi cubed. And so altogether, this thing is 2e v. So that's what the norm of the state is. Um, this idea of the volume of the universe, the idea is you put the universe in a box and uh, do box quantization. And uh, then the density of states is uh, the p cubed p v over h cubed is the number of states of a particular kind apart from spin in the phase space volume, the volume of the box, and the momentum space volume. This is h. We have h bar. h is equal to uh, h bar times 2 pi. So in our units, natural units, this is p cubed v over 2 pi cubed. So this v over 2 pi cubed is a natural thing. And um, this is the number of uh, We'll be using this for a number of states, in particular final states. Um, so to, all right, so let's see where I was. The probability of something is then S squared. But now we have to divide by all of the, by factors of 2EV for all the uh, initial and final state particles. And for practical purposes, we're going to have two in the initial state and however many in the final state. And so this is going to be m squared uh, 2 pi to the fourth delta squared. But 2 pi to the fourth delta is vt. OK, so it's 2 pi cubed delta is v. And Delta function of energy is, of course, t over 2 pi, where t is the time of this process. So s squared then is this. All right. And then we divide by all these factors, 2 ev. So I'll just write 2 evs apostrophe s. And um, so the rate is the probability over the time. And so that is m squared uh, 2 pi to the 4 delta v over again 2 ev. All right. Um, to get the cross section, we, this rate, 
we say is some sort of a cross section, and I'm going to write a tilde over there because um, I haven't yet put in the multiplied by the final states. So it's that times the flux. And um, the flux is the relative velocity divided by V, this quantization value. Are there any questions? I've got this bag of trouble here. By the way, Obama's going to be on the Daily Show tonight. I don't know if anybody watches the Daily Show. Here, through? Huh? He's supposed to be tonight? Yeah. Which was 9 o'clock on Comedy Central. All right. So, when we, so we, the sigma tilde then, is the rate divided by the flux, and so now we have uh, m squared, 2 pi to the 4, delta of energy moment, four momentum conservation. We now have the product of the two e's, and um, we've lost, um, Well, what happens is we get a V here. Let, let me keep it as two EVs, just for the moment. And then what we have is uh, the V fourth. Wait, wait, where's the V? No, I'm sorry. The, the Vs are in there. We're dividing by V, and then we have a V there. Okay, so. Actually, this is V squared, because there was a V from here. And when I divide by the flux, I get a little V and a V. Okay, so this is um, sigma. Sorry, what's the little v? Little v is the relative velocity. Yeah. And there's a the, okay. So in modern experiments. I mean, in the old days, you'd have to compute what the speed was because, you know, it might be significantly less than the speed of light. These days, if it's a fixed target experiment, V is 1. If it's a collider beam experiment, V is 2. Because they're both moving at the speed of light. And the speed of light is 1 in natural humans. Um, Okay, so this is the uh, cross-section, and now the cross-section d sigma into, so this is the real cross-section, is sigma tilde times number of final states. And so what this is then is m squared, 2 pi to the 4, energy momentum delta function, v squared over the two EVs, relative velocity, and now a product of dqp v over 2 pi cubed, and so I should say maybe in the same unit, apostrophe s for these final state ones, okay? All right. Now, what happens is all the v's cancel. Um, Actually, I'm a little concerned. All of these cancel, I just said. And um, I've checked that, of course, for the case of two particles goes to two particles. But if we have lots and lots of particles over here, um, oh, that's right. We have these two EVs are for initial and final state particles. So they do cancel. What you have, if you have let us say, two initial state particles. Then you have two of the Vs for the initial state. They cancel these two Vs. Then you have the Vs for the final state particles. They cancel these Vs. Okay. So everything works in general. And um, so we can just cancel all the Vs. And what we get is 
m squared, 2 pi to the fourth, energy momentum delta function, product dqp over 2 pi q for the final state particles. And then over here, we have uh, the product of the two e's for uh, all the particles, and then the relative velocity. All right. So that's our expression. And what one can do here is make it a little bit nicer. We can take the, the two e's of the final state particles and put them over here. And so then we just have 2e1, 2e2 for the initial and the two initial particles. So that basically is our formula for d sigma. Okay, so are there any questions about that? All right, well, um, as I did last time, uh, by the way, we were doing this in the center of mass, that's, that's or center of momentum, that's where V is 2 here. And um, let me see, I'm afraid I worked all that out in a sense last time. And so I don't think I should repeat that. Um, what we get then for two particles in the final state, so the V plus E minus goes to V plus mu minus, which is the process that we were considering, we got the D sigma D omega, again, center of momentum, is 1 over 2 EP, 2 EQ, those are these two factors. Um, there's a factor of uh, V, then um, you've got, let me see, Okay, we've got two particles in the final state, so we have 2 pi to the 6. So this is 2 pi squared here. And then, um, well, basically, uh, the, 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 this integral over the final state, together with the delta function, winds up giving us nothing more than k, the momentum in the final state, sum of quarter m squared, because we're summing over final state spins, averaging over initial space, state spins. And then we have uh, four E center of mass. Um, and so all together, letting V equal to two, what we wind up is one over two E center of mass, center of momentum squared k over 16 pi squared, another e center of mass, a quarter sum of the uh, m squared. And just to make a long story short, this is alpha squared over 4 e center of momentum squared. Square root of 1 minus mass of the muon squared over e squared. There are two e's here. There's the energy of each initial beam and then the energy in the center of mass. The energy in the center of momentum is the energy of the two beams added. And so this is 2E. This E then is ECM over 2. And this then is 1 plus M mu on squared over E squared plus 1 actually minus m mu on squared over e squared times cosine squared of theta, where what we've got, say, is uh, e minus e plus, and then the mu minus comes off in the angle theta. That's the theta. This alpha is e squared over 4 pi h bar c, or in natural units, e squared over 4 pi. And at, at low energies, it's 1 over 137. At um, 
higher end of these, it drops off somewhat. Um, down to about 1 over 128, right? and it goes up um, 45 on 45. So. In other words, somewhere near the C residence where left was doing its work. Um, the integral of d omega, of course, is 4 pi. Integral of cosine squared theta d omega it turns out to be 4 pi over 3. And so sigma, which is the integral of d sigma d omega d omega, is equal to, let me just give you the final answer, it's 4 pi over 3 e center of mass squared alpha squared square root of 1 minus and mu 1 squared over e squared times simply 1 plus a half and mu 1 squared over e squared. And um, one sees that this is in fact uh, what's observed. Um, the limit here, if you just have this process of e plus e minus goes to mu plus mu minus, you see as you let e go to infinity, this just has some types of 4 pi e, 4 pi, 4 pi alpha squared over 3 e center of mass squared. Um, notice in natural units, this is an area because e is an inverse length, so 1 over e is a length, 1 over e squared is a length squared, this is an area. And at high energies, the only dimensionful parameter in the problem is e, or e center of mass. So the thing has to be 1 over e center of mass squared times some constant. It also involves, the amplitude involves two factors of e. And so the probability involves four factors of e, so that gives you alpha squared. So you get these last two just from the most elementary physics, and so you expect that the thing is of order alpha squared over e squared, and indeed uh, pi and 3 essentially cancel, so it's a factor of 4. Um, in any event, what it looks like is that this is the threshold 2mu for e center of mass. The thing does something like that. And phase space does something like this. So this is phase space. Four pi alpha squared over three. All right. Well, so at very high energies, of course, you can just neglect the mass of the muon, and so d sigma d omega. Goes to alpha squared over 4 e center of mass squared times 1 plus cosine squared theta and um, sigma just goes to this. Well, if, if you want, what you can do is you can expand this term, and the first term in this and the first term of that cancel, and so if you want to be precious when you can say is this is 1 minus 3 eighths and mu over e to the fourth, but you know, why, why when we keep that term if one is throwing away these terms, I don't know. So in that plot, what is what is in the phase space? What is it? The, the plot in the ah, good question. What is phase space? Phase space would mean that this amplitude was just a constant. If you just let m be a constant, that's phase space. So let's, let's look at what that would mean. This m tossed out all these expressions here. So um, it would be d sigma d omega would be just alpha squared over 4 e squared 
and um, sigma would be uh, it would be just this structure here. It would just be four pi alpha squared over three e center of mass squared. So in other words, they have the same asymptote. But, um, I mean, in order for them to be the same asymptote, you have to say phase space is just replacing this by, by, well, I shouldn't say essentially one. You're replacing it by, you neglect, in other words, in this factor here, you're neglecting the mass of the muon and you're neglecting the angular dependence. Well, no, now you, that's a good question. What actually is phase space here? But it's, I, I, I think that the bottom line is that, that you're just neglecting the muon mass and you're neglecting, you, you can't be neglecting cosine squared theta because that contributes, when you integrate it, it contributes. A, a, Why are we interested in phase space at all? Well, suppose you wanted to test whether QED was a correct theory. Okay. So you'd, get, you'd measure this thing here, and you'd see that it, that it um, agreed with experiment. But then you'd say, well, why is it agreeing with an experiment? Is it because it's a true theory, or is it just trivial? And so if you do it, Phase space means you're doing a trivial theory, right? and but you're, you're you're quite right to ask exactly how one defines phase space here, and um, it it means you basically take all the structure out of the Feynman diagrams and just leave some. Uh, some constant, but you choose the constant correctly so that you get the same asymptote. That's effective. All right, any, oh, I owe you a candy. I don't know what candy you want. Here's an almond jar. And what, what determines alpha at higher energies? You said that. Oh, you know, it's, it's, that's a great question. It's that when you, when you, um, if you compute these processes, not to lowest order, which is what we're doing, yeah. but to higher order, um, then you get other terms. And those other terms uh, depend upon the energy center of mass, just as the lowest order term does. But they, they depend upon it differently. Okay. So you can then, then what you can do is you can say, well, the geometry is essentially the same. And so suppose you wanted to just use um, this elementary expression, in other words, the lowest order d sigma d omega, which is, say, this expression. You wanted to just use this expression, this formula, but you wanted it to be true at very high energies. You wanted to fit it to this formula. Okay. Well, then you'd use a different value of alpha. And you pick the value of alpha to, um, it, it would depend upon the energy. And it would go down essentially as the logarithm, of one over the logarithm, one over a constant plus the logarithm of the energy. Mm -hmm. Or one over a constant plus another constant times the logarithm of the energy. Yeah. Right. And um, that then is called a running coupling constant. So we'll get to that. Okay, well, this process that we're talking about, E plus E minus goes to mu plus mu minus, um, you can say, well, if you have this E plus E minus, suppose you look at other final states, what happens as you increase the energy? In other words, at, if you're below 2 m mu, you're essentially, all you've got is E plus E minus goes to E plus E minus. When you're above 
two n mu, then the final in the final state you have both electron pairs and muon pairs. But as you go higher in energy, you start getting hadrons. And the reason is that the process can be e plus e minus goes to q q bar. In other words, it goes to quark anti-quark. And well, what sort of quarks do we have? Well, we have an up quark, a down quark, a charm quark, a strange quark, a top quark, and a bottom quark. Now, these have very different masses, of course. These masses are down in the one or two uh, MeV range. This thing is around 100 or so MeV. This one is up around 1500 MeV or so. This one is around 5 GeV or so. I'm doing these from memory. I may be off by things. And this thing is around 180 GeV. So big question, big mystery, two mysteries. One, why do we have three of these? Why don't we just have U and D? Secondly, why are the masses so very, very different? These two guys are nearly massless. They're kind of like the electron mass. These guys are much heavier, and these guys are absurdly heavy. It's a factor of a thousand between the masses of these two, and then a factor of, uh, I don't know, 30 or something to go up there, 30 or 40. So there's, th these are wildly different. Moreover, I should write vectors over these because these come in three colors. And so, what we uh, and uh, for charges, these guys have charge two thirds e, and these minus one third e. Okay. But apart from that, the electromagnetic interactions of these quarks are just the same. So, in other words, instead of having uh, minus E, I'm taking E as positive, okay, E greater than zero. Instead of having minus E psi bar gamma mu psi A mu, well, you have exactly, all right, you have, for quarks, you have minus whatever, actually it's, not minus, it's plus whatever the charge of the quark is, psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. Okay, because minus e is the charge of the electrons, so q is the charge of the quarks. Um, of course, the absolute, it's only the absolute value of the charge that comes in, and so the result is that these cross sections, now let's go to high energy so we get away from the threshold then what you have is sigma to say u u bar is then 4 pi alpha squared over 3 e center mass squared. And I'm, I'm, I'm neglecting all the threshold effects. I'm neglecting the mass of the quark here. This is the asymptotic value when you're beyond the threshold. But then you have a factor of 3 for color. And then you have a factor of 2 thirds squared for the charge of the uh, up quark. And this would be the formula not only for u u bar, but also for c c bar and uh, t t bar, but of course only for energies much higher than, than, than their masses. Then for d d bar, s s bar, and b b bar, you have 4 pi alpha squared over 3 E center of mass squared times three for power times one third squared. And uh, in fact, this uh, the guys at Slack defined something called R, which is four pi alpha squared over three E center of mass squared. So this is, in other words, the asymptotic cross section for. Um, Muon, produ muon pair production. And this turns out to be, by the way, 86.8 nanobarns uh, over E squared. And um, 
So what, what you find is that sigma over r experimentally going from say 3 to maybe 20 GeV for E center of mass and you have here 1, 2, 3, 4. You start out in this range, you're a little above 2. And then in once you're beyond 3 Jeb, you start being uh, up about here, out to about 10 Jeb. And then as you go past that, you get up to nearly 4. And so you're, 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 you're there. And you stay there for a very long time because you're not going to produce TT bar until you're up at, well, energies that, I don't know if Slack ever got to energies that much. But anyway, now, this is not, I mean, this is what is seen roughly experimentally, but there are also resonances, because uh, for certain energies, you get um, bound states of BB bar, or SS bar, or CC bar, and so forth. So you have these various resonances like this that are especially true near threshold or just, just below threshold. I should put them there. So it looks kind of like that. All right, well, that's enough of that. Any questions? This, all, all this business, this experimental work was a big confirmation of um, QCD. In fact, um, Slack was a remarkably lucky laboratory. Um, they, uh, amount of physics that they discovered um, for the amount of money put into the machine is uh, a real high point on um, physics um, worldwide. At Fermilab you have the exact opposite. Tons of money went in, almost nothing came out. And as far as I know, there's not a single unexpected result, anything that's actually a discovery that was ever made at Fermilab. It's an embarrassment. Um, one lesson that may be drawn from that, which is a kind of dismal lesson, is that you're much better off having an initial state that you understand rather than having an initial state that you don't understand. And so at Slack, you had an electron and a positron, and you knew what they were because QE, QCD, not QCD, QED, quantum electrodynamics, is something where you can do perturbation theory and you can get answers to several significant figures, digits. Um, for example, it was way back in 1948 that Schwinger calculated the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, and he had it accurate to like a hundredth of one percent or something, really accurate. Um, uh, and so at slack you had E plus E minus, and then in the final state you would often have E plus E minus, um, or mu plus mu minus, or other things, and, and you could see what they were. They also had, before they did colliding beams of E plus E minus, they had E minus on uh, just protons, or neutrons, or nuclei. And so then they uh, knew what was coming in, and they could measure the electron going out, so they knew what the electron what was going out, so they could understand and interpret what the results of the experiment were. And when they found that they had too many electrons coming back, uh, they realized that there must be inside the proton point objects uh, against which the electron could be scattered. And so, in other words, they realized. Uh, I think this reason really is actually pretty slow, at least certainly very slow to come out in print. But anyway, it, they realized that they were redoing the Rutherford experiment, in which Rutherford was shooting alpha particles with a gold foil and finding too many alpha particles coming out backwards. So here they were finding too many electrons coming backwards, and they realized there were point particles in there, and these were then identified as quarks. Um, so it was. 
very lucky um, laboratory. All right, let's let's go on with this for a little bit further. Um, in most accelerators, and I think certain, I think it's also true of slack, but they they almost never are able to have polarized beams, and they almost never measure the polarization, the spin, in other words, of the outgoing uh, electrons and muons. But um, we could imagine that we did those experiments, and actually at um, at Brookhaven now, they claim that they have a certain amount of, um, that they have polarized proton beams to some extent. So I have this one quick question. Yeah. So this, these charges in the case of uh, this, the capital Q, so are in the case in, of? In, in that, the second, uh, second Hamiltonian? This. Yeah, so is it That's the charge like, of the quark. Is it treated like a parameter in your experiments, or I mean, what are we, I mean, our theory doesn't determine it. Oh. Okay, well, the, it, it, it comes from theory and, the, and experiment. Um, the first thing is that the charge of the proton is to enormous experimental accuracy minus the charge of the electron. Okay, all right. Secondly, um, sort of a combination of theory and experiment tell you that basically you've got two up quarks and one down quark in the proton. Well, that means that you've got two Q up plus Q down equals E. And then you also more or less know from some combination of theory and experiment that for the neutron, one up quark and two down quark give you is, is basically what you have in the neutron. There are also quark and quark pairs, gluons and so forth, and the whole thing is not, you know, it's, it's a complete mystery. And that's per, to some extent why Fermi Lab hasn't yielded as much, because the incoming particles, proton and antiproton, are two mysteries. Most of the stuff coming out is hadrons. There are more mysteries. So you've got mystery goes to mystery, and you measure the cross-section, and you, you can just understand it. And now we've repeated that at the LHC and uh, at RIC also, where we have the super mystery goes to super mystery because we have heavy ion collisions. I mean, it's better than parapsychology, but I think I'm, I'm Okay, so you can solve for the two equations, the two unknowns, and that's what you so our theories do have some way of predicting these charges. Sorry, say that so again. the theory does have some way of predicting the charges. Only we well, in this sense, to the extent that 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 um, the only unpaired quarks are two ups and a down, and two downs and an up, then that pretty well gives these two. But you're right. Nobody knows why the charge of the proton is minus the charge of the electron, and why the charge of the neutron is zero. I mean, that's what I used to do this little arithmetic. But experimentally, I think, uh, I, the fact, all right, let's, let's put it this way. The fact that, um, that these measurements work out quite well shows us that these charges are approximately two thirds. For example, the small bump up here comes because we've included the BB bar pairs, but they only have charge one third, so they don't give you that much. Whereas the jump here is because we have CC bar pairs. And that gives you four times the jump. All right. Any other questions? Do, do, do you need another candle? No, I'll take it later. Huh? I'll take it later. Okay. All right. Okay, quickly now. Um, remember what we have here is psi bar uh, I gamma mu d mu psi. This is the kinetic part of the. Fermions. 
um, where this is psi bar I gamma mu P mu plus I E A mu psi. And this thing is actually two different things. It's I C dagger times D0 plus I E A0 times the two by two identity minus grad plus IEA dot sigma C. That's the left-handed piece. And then there's a the right-handed piece, zeta dagger. Here I'm writing psi is C zeta. This is on the right field. E0 plus IEA0 pi plus grad plus I B A dot sigma zeta. Okay. So that's what we actually have. So the point is that this Feynman diagram that we talked about, or this basic vertex, uh, which we can think of as say electron goes to electron, it's actually two two vertices. It's C goes to C, and zeta goes to zeta. So those are the two. Um, so it's two processes. So in particular, there isn't any vertex. You don't have, remember, this is the left-handed field. This is the right-handed field. Now, if you say left-handed, that means that the, that the field transforms on the Lorentz transformations according to a certain representation of the Lorentz group. It also means that in the limit in which the mass of the fermion is zero, the um, C field annihilates and creates particles that are left-handed and zeta annihilates and creates particles that are right-handed. And remember also that if C is left-handed, then sigma 2 C star complex conjugate is right-handed. And um, so you, what you can have is a vertex like this, where you have a C and um, let me see how I drew this. Didn't I draw it at all? Hold on. Right. So the complex conjugate can exist there. And this is basically a left-handed electron and a right-handed positron. Okay. Now, um, anyway, we can imagine projecting onto uh, C and uh, zeta uh, by using gamma phi. And the reason is that the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0 is just a half I minus gamma phi, where gamma phi is simply um, 1 minus 1, 0, 0. And it's also equal to, um, let's see, it's I times, well, let's see, it's certainly plus or minus I times the product of all the four gamma matrices. I think it's plus I. And anyway, it's this in, um, let me get this straight. No, it's actually minus this in S control. Okay. So this is PS and uh, gamma 5 uh, Weinberg is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So, 
On the other hand, the projection operator, so to stay with the pest control notation, this is a half uh, I plus channel five. So that gives you the right hand one. So one can project onto the left and right hand ones. And if you did have polarized beams and um, you wanted to do E plus, E minus goes to mu, well, E minus mu plus. Um, and you wanted to use, um, say, right-handed electrons and left-handed positrons, then what you do is you have, you insert a, a 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 UP, and this would project at, well, P and S. This would project onto right-handed electrons and left-handed uh, positrons uh, in the initial state. And now, so that's what you do. And if you also did it in the final state, and let me remember what the what we actually decided. We also measure the polarizations of the atom muons, and it looks like that. Now, let me just say, in as much as we have right-handed in and the positron, that corresponds to a vertex where we have a zeta going in and uh, a zeta star representing the positron. And so this is right-handed, and this is effectively left-handed. So that's the, the particular vertex. And um, now, why is it that this works? Um, oh, let me mention something else. This is equal to V dagga gamma zero gamma mu one plus gamma five over two u. If this thing is a projection operator, and so it's equal to its square, so I can put a square there. Then I can move this thing through these two, and nothing happens because it, the gamma 5 anti commutes with both gammas. And so this is equal to V dagger 1 plus gamma 5 over 2. Gamma 0, gamma mu, 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 u. So in both cases, we're pulling out the. Um, the so 1 plus gamma 5 is this, so we're pulling out the zeta field, or the right-handed field in both cases, and um, because over, if, since we're looking at this process, we have a zeta star and a zeta, and so this is another word, zeta star, zeta dagger, and this is um, zeta. And so what we've got is a right-handed, say, electron going in, and so it's um, how do I want to say it? it looks like this? That's the way the angular momentum is. And now the uh, positron is coming in, and it is a left handed positron. So you have the right handed electron, left handed positron, and um, its spin also looks like that. And so the two spins add, and you get spin one, which is what you have for the photon. Um, all right, so that's how that goes. Um, and I, I, let's see, I haven't thought of this so let me just wing this one. Suppose you have an electron coming in. Well, in this case, it's left-handed. And then it's going out. It's again left-handed. Um, um,
Anyway, the mathematics shows you that this is the way it works. Um, um, as far as the angular momentum, it makes it see orbital is involved or so. Anyway, let's go on. If, I'm not going to go through the details. The Heston and Schroeder basically do. When, if you have an extra 1 plus gamma 5 in there, then uh, when you sum over the initial, average over the initial and sum over the final spins, you get um, extra term. You, you get these traces as we did uh, on Monday. And what you find is uh, d sigma d omega for um, e minus e plus right left goes to mu minus mu plus um, right left. This turns out to be, again, the high energy is alpha squared over 4, e center mass squared times 1 plus cosine theta squared. If you do it the other way around, that is to say, mu minus left, mu plus right, what you get is alpha squared over 4, Again, e center of mass squared 1 minus cosine theta squared. So you can see if you add them up, what you get is the 1 plus cosine squared, which is what we saw um, over here. And in fact, um, if you also do the, if you flip these, then um, if you flip these, Keeping this constant, that also gives you a minus. And if you flip both of them, you get back to that. And so you add them all up and you get the same uh, thing that we had. Um, what doesn't happen is sigma, for example, e minus right, e plus right goes to muons. This is zero. And it's zero because there isn't any vertex that has um, that has a. In other words, you don't have any vertex, but you have zeta coming in and uh, say c star. Um, so that vertex just doesn't exist, and um, so that process is zero. All right, the, I thought the next thing I'd do would be a quick, I, I'd be doing something that I, that's kind of like the homework problem that I solved. The homework problem was two photons go into E plus E minus. This is a new homework assignment, tentatively due Monday. But you can use the Feynman rules. And um, all right, let me do the let me, let me do the following calculation, which will illustrate how it is that I want you to do. So let's just do electron-electron scattering. This is a little harder than the one you have. Well, no, it's, I don't know. It might, it might be a little easier. I'm not sure. There are two diagrams. So if you pull these. P and Q, P prime, Q prime, P and Q, Q prime, P prime. Then uh, the Feynman rules are going to give us that I M is. Well, what are the rules? The rules are you have an outgoing electron, so you have a U bar. P prime, S prime, you have a vertex minus I E gamma mu, that's this vertex. You have an incoming electron, that's a U of P and S. You have a photon propagator, that's minus I eta mu nu over, and you know what it is. This thing is just the momentum. You have four momentum conservation of every vertex, so if you have momentum P going in and P prime going out, this has to be P minus P. And you can ignore the i epsilon here. Then you do this part of the diagram. It's u bar of q prime t prime 
of vertex minus i e, but now you can't call it gamma mu again, you have to call it gamma nu. And then you have the incoming electron u of q, and I guess, what is this, qt is where I'm going. Okay, that's that diagram. But then what you have is plus or minus the other diagram. And the other diagram is u bar now of q prime and t prime minus i e gamma mu u of p and s minus i eta mu nu over, and now the momentum in this one is p minus q prime <coughs> squared. And now the rest of this is u bar of p prime s prime minus i e gamma nu u of q and t coming in. All right, so these are the two diagrams. And you, so the homework problem that you're going to have to do is you just draw the other diagrams, what other diagrams are for gamma gamma goes to e plus e minus. And then you're going to get, with the Feynman rules, you're going to get something like this, and something like that, but of course it'll be different. And then you have the problem of the relative sign. Now the overall sign uh, doesn't matter because um, because you're going to take the absolute value squared to get the, get the cross section. Uh, if you're doing things to higher order, however, then you have to get straight the overall sign because you're going to get a higher order contribution and you need to get its phase and this phase right. You are, you, to put it differently, you need the relative phase between the lowest order and the first order correction. You need the relative phase right. And when you do, when you are dealing with that, you, the, the way to get the relative phase right is to use the same initial and final states that they involve fermions because if you use different initial states, you're going to possibly have a minus sign or different final states. In other words, the order of the annihilation and creation operators in the initial state and the final state would introduce minus signs, and then you'd screw up the overall sign of the lowest order or of the highest order or both. So you've got to use the same convention for the two. And, um, I think the only way to get it straight is to go back to the expansion of the time order product of the exponential of the... In other words, I'm going to try to sh sh show you what direct psi is here, but the way I'm going to do it, well, first of all, physically you expect a minus sign, because you expect Fermi statistics, so with the final state, you'd expect a minus sign. But that intuition, uh, that kind of intuition, at least my confidence in my intuition on this kind of an issue, is I've given myself 60-40 odds. Okay. Um, actually, I remember what the answer is, so I know my odds are better than that. But in general, that's what I'd say. So I only feel good if we actually write this thing as in other words, if you do it this way, so zero a of q prime t prime a of p prime s prime time order product e to the minus i integral. Well, it's uh, actually what is it? Is it? No, I don't remember. Yes, it's minus. So this is actually plus p. E. Oh wow! I got that wrong. Wait, it's, yeah, that's right. It's a minus there, so there is an overall, whatever there is, plus i, psi bar m mu psi a mu in four times. In other words, this, oh wait, no, that's the Lagrangian, sorry. That's the Lagrangian with a minus e. The Hamiltonian has a plus e, and so there is a minus, so I actually have this right. Okay. So this is the time order product. And then 
as I say, you need to decide what your Okay, so this is a sensible, I mean, there are, you know, you can do it any way you want. The important thing is, once you decide what your initial state is and what your final state is, you keep it that way and respect it. And if you do a higher order computation, you use the same ones. Okay. And I picked this one with the PS, I mean, sorry, PQ, and then made this one QP in the thinking that basically this was kind of the adjoint of the first. That gives you the natural overall sound. All right, well, if we once again so sort of stop a dagger QT at x2 and we get a factor of 2, I don't. Oh, there's very little time left. I don't see there's any point in my keeping track of the overall of the overall sign or the overall magnitude, but well, it's probably easier if I do actually. Okay, so uh, what we have here is integral time order product psi bar. It turns out that has to be minus. This is psi plus. So we get a minus sign because it has to go across. I'm doing the first diagram. Then this guy, the annihilation operator here, hits this. But in order to get there, it has to cross this one. So it has another minus sign. So altogether, there's a plus. So this thing gives us a plus for this diagram. So in other words, there's no change, we stay with a minus. On the other hand, if yeah, all right, so I, ha I still haven't gotten to the issue of the minus sign. So this is just minus e squared, square root of 2 e over this 2 e cubed, 2 e p. Okay, and now we have the, now the minus sign issue still haven't gotten to it. Time order product, by bar minus x1 gamma mu. This is gone. A mu x1 by bar minus x2 gamma nu, a nu, and we basically got that. Okay, and I'm leaving out the phase back. E, right? And I left out the d4 phases. Now, what is what are the vertices? This is x1, this is x2. So if we create p prime, and if we use x1 to create p prime, then the creation operator here mates with this one, and the creation operator here mates with that one, we have no change in sign. If on the other hand, we at x1 we create q prime, then this creation operator has to cross one Fermi field, Fermi operator, give it a new minus sign, and then the other one mates with the P. So there's a minus sign, and so we know then that this is a minus sign. So at that point, you can stop this calculation, uh, or you can continue it if you want. In the online notes, I continued it. But, um, so that's that's, that's how you determine the minus signs. You just have to, I don't think this, I mean, if your intuition and experience are really good, you can say, ah, Fermi statistics in the final state, bingo, minus sign. 
if you don't feel good about that, um, then uh, then do this. And with a little experience, you can get very good at this. I mean, you get you can get the right answer within uh, just a couple of minutes doing this expansion. And in particular, don't keep track of any of these overall signs and phase factors. Just try to keep track of where the annihilation operators are and go into the space-time diagrams, and then you'll see where the minus signs are. All right, so that's enough of that. I guess next we'll do Compton scattering, and then um, and then uh, I, I guess we'll then go into path intervals if that makes sense. Any so, questions? So this uh, early statistics thing, I think uh, using that idea of intuition would make sense so long as you are in the same order. Right? I mean, if you get a higher order term and you want to fit that into it, I mean, how would you think about that? I mean, would you go for the anti-symmetric nature at each? Well, in other words, sorry, I'm winging it so I don't know. But I would think that if, for example, this diagram that you've got, say, were one like that, it seems to me that this guy would come in with the same sign as this one. But I'm really winging it here because, in fact, this is going to throw in, OK, a, you've got an eye from the vertex an eye from the propagator and an eye from the vertex. Okay? So it doesn't mean that it comes in with the same sign, but I would expect that if this is P and Q, and this is P prime and Q prime, I would expect that if this is Q prime and P prime, I would expect that there's a minus sign difference between these two. Okay. What the and, and the, the relative phase between this one and this one is whatever this thing gives you when you carry it out to the next order. So there is, I mean, that is what I was trying to say. That I mean, at the same order, you could probably use this kind of thing about statistics. But if you if you want to find the relative phase between mm -hmm. different orders, the final answer is always this. And of course, don't forget that when you get to a time ordered product, if you have the time ordered product here, this thing is a bosonic quantity, psi bar, psi bar psi, psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. That's a bosonic object. But when you get down to a time ordered product with just two Fermi fields, there's a built in minus sign that you have to keep straight. And you have to know which one has the minus sign. I guess that's so, Wouldn't you expect that the overall phase would depend just on the number of vertices? You mean the overall magnitude? No, I mean at each order, the overall phase, the relative phase between two orders would just depend on the number of vertices? I, I mean, one might expect that. Why do you expect that? If that is all that is different. Um, what? Because that is all that is different. Right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you you may be right. I'm I'm. I've never tried to do that. 